My name is Elena Krasnow. Welcome to Press Play, the Street Cred Podcast. I'm so grateful you're here. I'm the marketing manager at Street Cred PR and your host for today's show, along with co-host and managing partner, Jimmy Moak. We will break down the show into two segments, press where we dive into all the hard news about our guest life and their professional goals, and then play where we have a little extra fun with it. Today, Jimmy and I are so excited to be joined by Chris Sherry. To give our listeners a little more background on our guest, Chris joined the award-winning Future Proof team in 2023 as head of strategic partnerships. If you have somehow not heard of Future Proof, it is the world's largest event brand dedicated to the modernization and advancement of the wealth and investment management industry. Future Proof organizes a variety of events throughout the calendar year, all of which leverage cutting edge event technology to connect people across the financial services industry. With pioneering formats such as outdoor festivals and curated retreats, Future Proof is reimagining the next era of finance events. And the proof is in the pudding as Future Proof just earned a world-class NPS score of 74. Chris was recruited to be a key driver behind what could be described as Future Proof's most innovative product, Breakthrough which consists of three distinct programs across Future Proof's events. These include the Breakthrough Meetings Program, Breakthrough Talks, and Breakthrough Experiences. At this year's Future Proof Festival, the technology helped facilitate over 30,000 one-to-one meetings, 166 peer-to-peer roundtables, and 55 unique experiences. Previously, Chris spent seven years as Chief Engagement Officer at Jay Connolly, a financial services communications and marketing firm. She is an expert at driving successful partnerships on a large scale and has a deep understanding of the role technology plays in accentuating in-person connections. Chris, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Elena. Jimmy, I feel like you should just write my messaging. That was perfect. (laughs) Thank you. Right on point. Everything you said. So great to have you on board. And uh, besides my own breakthrough meetings, I feel as if since the launch of Future Proof, I've probably had close to 30,000 one-on-one meetings myself <laughs> while at the events. Probably not an exaggeration, but yeah, Seriously. with that many people in one place, it just happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. We're really excited to get into this conversation and talk all things Future Proof. But before we dive in, we ask all of our guests this question, which is, what did you have for lunch today? Oh, you're going to like this. I haven't eaten yet. I do enter. <laughs> I generally do not eat until one or so I didn't eat today, but I don't do like the full intermittent fasting. So I let, I'll eat late. Okay. Like, I grew up Italian. We eat late. I still eat late, especially in New York. It's harder in Fort Lauderdale because everything closes. But um, yeah, so <laughs> I haven't eaten anything. There you go. Okay. So what <laughs> did you have for lunch? That's all you got. That's all you got. <laughs> what did you have for lunch yesterday? We got, we need something. <laughs> all right. Yes. Yesterday, we took clients to St. Ambrose down in Brookfield. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Maybe one of my favorite restaurants in the city. It's really gorgeous. It's inside Brookfield. Um And obviously we have a lot of clients down there in the financial world. So it's become one of my go-to places uh, to host lunch. So I had uh, veal bolognese and don't judge. Wow. People people are so against veal, but um, if you don't tell anybody at the table before you order, they won't give you that look like, oh, why are you eating veal? So I just, (laughs) uh, yeah, it's pretty good. (laughs) And you're sticking to your Italian roots with the bolognese. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. They do it very nicely. So yeah, that's what I had yesterday. So I do eat lunch, just okay. not yet today. <laughs> totally fair. We're all on our own schedules. <laughs> um, did you have a favorite food truck at Future Proof this year? Um, you're probably, I actually didn't eat a lot of the food trucks. It was so, so busy for me because- That makes I sense. was on stage doing a lot of emceeing and then I was running around seeing clients. Then we had meetings in our space. Um, I wanted to see a couple of people sessions. And so- it would be like middle of the day and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need a snack. And so I think maybe some people brought me snacks from the food truck, but <laughs> I honestly have no recollection of like going up to a food truck. Oh my getting- God, that is the treatment yeah. you deserve. <laughs> yeah. No, and it was, I would have loved to do that. Like I think, I think the food trucks are awesome. Just never like had the time this year. And we had totally. three, three different areas. Um, but I definitely sampled some truffle fries that I was impressed with. Ooh. Um, don't really have any other memories other than that, except that. Well, you just jogged my memory. So if we can take a quick stroll down memory lane, (laughs) there was a truck that had grilled cheeses. This year? This year. And and it had fresh mozz, 
uh, tomato and a pesto spread Yum. on the grilled cheese. And Jimmy might have had a handful of those, <laughs> more, more than one. That's pretty foodie for a food truck. I'm impressed. Seriously, I like it. Almost sounds like a caprese grilled cheese hybrid. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was. It was vibing. So, I'm into it. I, I, I clearly missed out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were busy doing a lot of other incredibly important stuff to make this magical event all that it was. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Chris, tell us a little bit about just your background and how you first connected with the Future Proof team. Yeah, of course. So. Um, my, I have, this is like a whole second career for me. I was actually a dental hygienist, army wife, moved around, never thought, I mean, my dad was a Morgan Stanley advisor. So like we watched the ticker and I was, you know, understood the financial language just because my dad as an advisor and his clients, but, um, didn't get into it till I moved across the street from Jen Colley, who was the CEO of a PR company. And I started okay. teaching her yoga and I started teaching the team yoga. Um, and that was a fun fact, not many people knew, but I actually, that is so cool. At Jay Conley for four years. And then Jen was like, you know, PR. I'm like, I don't think I do. But so she let me shadow her around the city. And I was like, Oh, I, I think I can do this. So I got hired by the team and just it became natural to me within a couple of years and got a lot of great relationships there and loved what I did there. But, um, going to future proof was one of the 12 events that I did in 22, um, wow. moderated a panel on M a with David Cantor and Kevin Corbett. It was Wednesday morning at nine o'clock. Big boy had just performed. And I was like, Oh, no one's going to come tomorrow. Like I can't <laughs> believe we have this nine o'clock session. Like, Oh my gosh. And maybe it was because David Cantor had just left Fidelity and everybody wanted to know what he had to say, but it was full. And I was yes. like, well, I was sitting on the stage, like looking at the beach and it just felt like no other conference I had ever been to. So I kind of fell in love. And a couple months later, I saw Matt, our CEO at Schwab. And I was like, hey, I want to talk to you. Like, I want to hear more about what you're building and like how you saw that vision. Like that, that's been so needed to get us out of the cold boardrooms that we all want to escape and find the first happy hour, the first time you could go to your room and do some emails, right? Um, and six weeks later, I, I came to work there in January of 23. That is awesome. So I had no idea you were a dental hygienist. Yeah, in right. A, in a former <laughs> life. And I used to not, Jimmy, that was something like I was, I think, insecure about 10 years ago. And then I was like, you know what? Why? You you have 10 people from different demographics and different ages. And like you have to make those 10 people throughout the day feel comfortable and relaxed. And that gave me so much totally. great people skills and like the ability to make them feel calm. And I think that helped me to do what I do today, which is jump from call to call and communicate with different people and try to be a good listener and understand their needs and tie into them. And so you would have never thought that translated into sales or PR, but it actually set me up to be very successful uh, to manage that many different personalities and needs and be able to accommodate. It just, it made totally. me very, um, I have a lot of like emotional intelligence. I think I can read a room yeah. and that did not come from financial services. It came from my work with taking a, a person back to my room every hour who didn't want to be there. Like, and then you have to change that and bring them into a comfortable state. So I still use those skills today, I'm not cleaning anyone's teeth in over 10, 11 years now. Um, <laughs> but I certainly feel that like that was a skill that you need in sales or in relationships. Um, oh, so yeah. I, that kind of gave me the ability to do what I'm doing now. I have the same belief about being a former waiter and bus boy. Mm -hmm. You know, this is before <laughs> I got into my professional career, but yeah multitasking and talking to different people. Now, this is going to maybe blow your mind or maybe you'll roll your eyes. Who knows? <laughs> but just this week on Slack, the company was talking about electronic toothbrushes. And I finally took the plunge and I got myself a Sonicare. Oh, and do you love it? Holy shit. What have I been missing? <laughs> yeah. It'll change your life, right? A good toothbrush. Yeah. I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't sold anybody a toothbrush in a long time, but I could sell like a champ back in the day. I bet <laughs> you could. Yeah. And you could tell the difference between those who use them and those who don't, those who are flossing regularly, those who don't. <laughs> like, I'm sure 
Like no one was able to lie to you while they're in the chair, right? Oh, yeah. No, that's funny. Yeah. I guess there are sales skills too, right? But you're not mm -hmm. selling something that people don't need or won't have impact from. And I think that's the beauty of Future Proof, like the product that we're building. I'm not trying to sell a conference or a sponsorship to something that I don't think is going to add value or impact. In fact, I don't mm -hmm. want to sell one. Like if they're not bought in by the time I'm speaking to them, and I'm, the last thing I'm doing is convincing them to be there. You, what you don't want is a sponsor or a client or an attendee who was sold to be there. Totally. Um, do that because what, what's happened with our brand and what you see um, on social media and with influencers is it's just selling itself. So yeah. um, that's a gift to be part of a team that is working on something that you're really just saying, like, how can we give you the best experience, give you the most impact for the resources you want to spend? Um, and I like that. That that feels good. Definitely. Not trying, you know, sell something that someone doesn't need. Yeah. And I think part of that is because of how much the festival brings out people's humanity. So it resonates with them in such a deep, authentic way where it feels very natural to then go be an evangelist of this festival, because why wouldn't you be talking it up? It's amazing. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't always easy. There's a lot of people like, so that first year, um, the industry didn't fully accept it. They were, oh, it's a boondoggle. You guys are wearing cough shirts. And, you know, there was definitely a lot of like pushback. And mm -hmm. my response was always like, you know, you could come try it for yourself. Like you don't need to sponsor, but when you're dressed in your comfortable self, I'm not in my high heels in a suit that I'm uncomfortable in. And you actually feel more authentic and genuine. And I think when you have those interactions, when you feel comfortable, I think business gets done. Like totally. if I, I think about old, like old school salt days was at the Bellagio and people had all the cabanas, but so much business got done out there. And like that got, you know, labeled as a boondoggle and they moved it to the Java center or whatever. But I mean, you could say whatever you want, but people were comfortable and business was getting done. And so it's a yeah. totally different event a totally different target a totally different audience but um i think it does go back to letting people just be in their natural state yeah. and getting the most um productive results out of that when you're interacting and networking totally yeah and the proof has been in the pudding in terms of the numbers right yeah yeah i think we had almost 4400 i think the final number was like 4279 and like we wow. waited to like share the real number because we didn't want, like, sometimes you'll get a list. I don't know if you've experienced this. I'm not calling out any other conference, nor would I want to do that. But I think there's a list of, because you have a lot of people that register that don't show up or cancel. You have duplicates. But, like, we actually waited till we had the real number. And if you were there in person and you can see the pictures, um, it's pretty evident that that number didn't need to be anything <laughs> other than factual. But um, yeah, I think it was like, we went from 1400 to 2300 to 4200. So pretty exciting growth, pretty quick. It was Amazing. truly a sea of people. Like it was You're so right. impressive seeing the aerial shots of the festival. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> it is so big. And yeah. so many people I talked about that, talked to us about that, about how it was just bustling and so vibrant with life with everybody. Yeah. So many humans. Yeah, um, cool. Okay, so you officially joined the team in 2023. Tell us a little bit from your perspective about, or for the festival in 23, um, and tell us a little bit about how things have evolved since then. Because now there's like a few other events in the mix. How, tell yeah. us this. Yeah. Sure. So the first year in 22, where I explained that whole, my experience there, there was no technology. There was no one-to-one -one meetings. It was basically, can we take an event and put everything outside? Can we build mm. stage? exhibit booths can we take everything out into a parking lot and turn it into a convention area slash festival which is what we did or they did I wasn't there then in 23 we launched breakthrough which was and I, I have a couple of different analogies but in my mind it's like oh I would go to these conferences and I had a couple of handful of people that I would just text or LinkedIn are you going to be there but there really was no certainty on who you were going to meet when you were going right. to get to the conferences and like you know would I walk by some booths which which didn't work well from a PR person because people are spending money to be there to get advisors. So the last thing they want is a, a PR person coming to sell to them, right? So if I could have had a tool like Breakthrough that allows you to act like a dating app. So before you even get there, you're creating a profile, you're identifying your target market, you're making outbound requests, then you're getting inbound requests. And five days before you get there, you have 
between 10 and 24, however many you decide to schedule for yourself, like meaningful one-to-one connections that you definitely know are going to happen. And yes, you're going to see somebody at a coffee stand. And yes, you're going to bump into someone at the welcome reception and maybe they're the right fit to work with you. Or maybe you're just having fun. But when you add in the technology, which is what we launched in 23, the response was overwhelming. So we came out of 23 and we were like, oh, wow, we're getting this huge feedback. Do we wait a whole year to run this program again where people made these true connections in these 15 minute meetings? So Matt said, let's have a smaller, like more intimate event where mm-hmm. we really just focus on the buy side and the sell side and giving them as many you know, lead gen interactions as possible. We'll get no exhibit booths, no media, no marketing teams. Let's just bring the buy side and the sell side together. Let's do it in a beautiful place at the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs. If you've never been, it's like really lovely, so pretty. Like you don't even need to leave the facility and you can just have an amazing time. Um, So we did that and it was on a smaller scale, but we were still providing, you know, one a ways to interact, not just with the one-to-one meetings, but then we launched the breakthrough talk. So conversations that happened during meals where advisors could opt in to a topic And instead of being spoken to or talked at all the time, they were allowed to engage in the conversation, Mm. which is what they want, right? Like you can hear content anywhere. You can get online and listen to anybody talk and hear content. So people, yes, there's cool content, but you're not going to an event for content. You're going to an event to network, meet new leads, entertain your existing clients, right? So I think launching the retreat was one-to-one meetings. Breakthrough talks, which are the roundtable conversations that happen during a meal, and then experiences. So sponsors said let they could host. We did turnkey, so we did fly fishing, falconry, pickleball lessons. We did all these things where a sponsor could pay fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars. All they had to do was show up, and then they would go out with 15 to 18 advisors and just have an experience. And it's not a hard sell. You're not going out and pitching them while you're zip lining, but you're forging a relationship. You know, yeah. you have two hours with them. So it's a different, another way to interact and engage a network. We also launched our networking dinner series there at the retreat. So a sponsor could host a dinner. We'd source the venue. We did the menus, turnkey, everything. It goes on the platform. So advisors can opt into it. So all the sponsor does is they show up and they get to engage with advisors, which is, it's hard to do. Like sometimes they're like, oh, we want to have this event and interact with advisors, but how do we get them to show up? Right. And then you got to pick a restaurant and you got to, you know, there's just a lot that goes involved. So we're like, well, let's do it a dinner series. We'll do all the work for them and then let them go just enjoy their time with the advisors. Um, so we did that there, that for the first time. And then we took all those things and did them at the festival in 24, which is what we just came out of and what I think um, caused this insane momentum that we're feeling right now uh, about our approach and our format to events. Totally. You have- Forgive the lame joke, but you've future proofed networking, more or less. Would you agree? Yeah, look, that's the what we strive to be, like the best networking platform around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, like, I mean, it's a bonus that we have cool formats and then we're outside and we have concerts and like food trucks. Those are all just bonuses. Like people don't go to events for that. They go to events to come back with real leads and say, hey, I, I went to this conference and I came back and now I have two or three more clients. Maybe I did 18 meetings. Maybe 10 of them were really good. Maybe five of them I had a, five, a follow-up call. And now three of them are my clients. You know, it's a numbers game. Yeah. Um, and, and all the other enjoyment that you experience when you're there is, is just a bonus, right? Yeah. But like you were saying, like having these experiences that are so unique, going zip lining with someone, doing falconry yeah. with someone, yeah. you're never going to forget that. That is going to stick no, with you. It's memorable, right? And like, I think the younger generation, like they, they want to spend time and money on experiences. Like mm-hmm. if you understand, like I'm obviously in the older generation, but I also, I, even though I'm not a millennial, I think like a millennial, like I want to spend money on experiences. I want to have memories. Like, yes, I want nice things, but I think it's more important like to live. And so I yeah. think we're providing formats that let people feel like they're living mm-hmm. and you're still working. And I think and, that's a nice balance to give yeah. industry. And that's also very aligned with the direction the industry is going. You know, it's becoming so much more human behavioral science focused all the time. So it just blends itself really nicely to the future as we've been talking about. You stole my thinking right there, (laughs) Elena. I mean, look, any good wealth advisor right now is going to tell you 
uh, yeah, you want more risk in your portfolio now, so it's you're not taking it when you're old. But then they'll also tell you like to spend money on those experiences, like do them now while you can. Um, mm-hmm. I know it's a lot different when we're talking about an event at a point in time, but look, as someone who has been to as probably as many trade shows as you, Chris, um, kudos to you and Kevin and Matt and Niall and the rest of the team because, um, you know, notice was served long ago that things are different now. Well, look, I think COVID changed a lot for people. So old school sales before COVID, um, people spent a lot of money on boxes at the Yankee game or you know, F1, whatever that race is, like taking (laughs) a lot of money is spent to entertain clients, right? And Mm -hmm. those clients want those experiences. So we're providing all those things in a turnkey way, maybe not as exciting as a box at a Yankees game, but it is an experience that they get to go well and do for a lot less resources. Um, So I, I think that's something that's also putting us on the map. And I don't know that anyone's doing it yet. Hopefully they'll copy us. I think that's a form of flattery when people try to, I don't, I don't view that. That doesn't bother me at all. I think it's good. People trying to evolve. I use this analogy sometimes, Um, you know, sponsors will push back on, I don't get an attendee list. Like I don't understand why I don't get an attendee list or, and I say, okay, we have 4,200 people there. (laughs) Would you join a dating app that gave away your phone number just because you joined it? Or you'd be like, uh, no. Because when the advisors leave those events, they're just getting spammed with all these emails that, frankly, they maybe want to talk to two of the almost 300 sponsors we had. Could you imagine what that would do to our advisor base? Um, So I think Matt's vision to like tackle all those pain points is what he heard for so long working in events. And he's doing it in so many different silos. So yes, it's the breakthrough. But yes, it's the way we treat the advisor so they don't Mm -hmm. feel like product like they're in the driver's seat if they don't meeting with you you're not getting it you're not getting that meeting no one's forcing someone to sit in a meeting because who wants that totally you you want a free hotel or listen to a timeshare pitch no no one no one wants to do that so you let the advisor pick who they want to meet with so there's other ways i think that we've done a good job of recognizing what the frustrations are at other events and trying to improve that. And there's a balance, right? Because I want to take care of sponsors. I want to give them anything they ask for. But it's also saying like, if I do that, our advisors may not be 2000 next year. It might only be 1200 because they just don't want to feel like that, you know? Totally. Yeah. And and sometimes I'd imagine that the ball is dropped. If we were, if we were taking the old school approach of, yeah, they get the list and then that spamming happens. Like, I can't tell you how many times people are spamming me thinking that I'm an advisor, right? And they're trying to sell me a, a CRM or a portfolio rebalancing tool or whatever it might be. That happens, right? Like, so the sponsor that you're talking to knows what she or he wants out of the event. But at some point, it gets passed down to a marketing department that it is just spams people. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wouldn't you rather have gone through the, you know, breakthrough dating app and found your select 20 people that chose you yes. and you chose them, then you get their email addresses. Those are the quality leads. All yeah. that huge list isn't going to do anything for anyone except annoy people. Totally. Right. No, I so. think the double opt-in is so intelligent in terms of the technology and also just the the diversity through like the talks, the experiences, the one-to-one meetings. There really is something for everyone and you can really cater to people's individual personalities. Like I think it's so cool that you guys have non-work related interests as a way for people to match up through breakthrough. I had someone reach out to me and be like, I think we're the only two people who said we were interested in Zumba at this whole conference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that is so cute. That's funny. There was another so there's also another thing that we didn't talk about yet was our breakthrough listing. So we have such a large audience like that. And then you have a lot of people who want to garner an audience within their own space, right? People spend a lot of money to have these custom spaces on the boardwalk. You've seen them. Um, So we have provided these listing options. So for example, Vanguard listed that they were going to be doing some indexing demo. They paid us to put it on the platform and then advisors could sign up. We limited how many could people do that. And then everyone shows up and they didn't have to wonder would people really show up or try to figure out who to invite. So it's like there, 
everyone can look at it and review it. Is it something they're interested in? Um, so there's all kinds of ways we're figuring out how to improve the platform and how to give people more access to the audience without it being, I hope I meet the right person. Right. And I, I think about like in the eighties, you would, maybe you'd hitchhike somewhere, right? You might've hitchhiked. That's what we did today. Would you ever hitchhike? No, you'd get on Uber and say, I need a pet <laughs> car. It's 7am to take me to LAX. You would never just wake up and say, I hope I get a good car to drive me to LA. Like <laughs> you don't operate like that. Yet the majority of our conferences still just say, here we are, let's meet great people. And it works. Sometimes it works, but I think adding in the technology, the mix is what's really, really put us on the map. Totally. Okay. Tell me just one favorite moment from the festival, like fun anecdote, fun story. What was a moment that really resonated with you this year? Oh, there were so many. So I actually was, I was lucky enough to do opening remarks with Michael Batnick and he, I don't know if you know him, but he's just yeah. a super chill guy. Um, and I, I know him. I know his style. So we talked a little bit. I said nothing about outfits because my outfits are like a thing. I have like seven outfit changes. Like I love it because you're on stage. Your outfits like, are incredible. Party. Like I even bought a blue silk dress for the BNY welcome reception. So I could, I love it. you know, tie into them because they're such a good, <laughs> but if you have all these, you know, things in mind and I was like, oh, for welcome, I know Batnik is casual and chill. So I'm going to wear a white t-shirt and just a small skirt and tennis shoes. Like it was perfect. And I loved the welcome remarks because it's that build up and everybody was really excited about it. Um, so that was fun. And I was, you know, grateful to get to do that. Um, yeah. walking into the welcome reception and that the hype of people's excitement and the, the smile on people's faces. And just like, it wasn't just me or our team that looks forward to, you could feel that everyone was like very much looking forward to that. That was a, a definitely a high for me. And then closing remarks, I was not set to do closing remarks. Our CEO was, he got pulled into something. He literally calls me like 30 minutes before and says, can you do them? I'm like, yeah, of course. I was already like, I'm seeing that day. And my daughter, she's 19. She's working the event. He had said a couple of times when she watched me moderate, she was like, oh, I wish I knew what it felt like to be on the stage. So I brought her up stage. I brought her <laughs> on stage with me for the closing remarks. And there was like still people in the audience. And I just told everyone, you know, thank you and what we're doing next. And, you know, how grateful we were for everyone being there. Um, and it was cool just to let her come up on stage. And so that I enjoyed doing that with her. That was fun. Um, but yeah, I could, go, I could go into so many because um, it really was, I think you said magical earlier. And I, yeah, magical. Um, Definitely. I know, I still haven't even put. Yeah, there we cute. are. <laughs> That's so cute. cute. So I um, I haven't even posted on LinkedIn. I literally just I left. I took it all in, and there was so many overwhelmingly like best conference ever. Like we'll never miss again. Like the things people writing were so just gracious and overwhelming. I was like, how do I even like what would I possibly post? Like let just everyone else say how amazing it was. I just don't think I could post anything. I do have a picture with Damon and Terrence who were like the main photographers. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, you know what? I should post them and say, thank you for doing such a great job and all your drone shots and everything you did so that we can like, that this lives on. Um, but yeah, it's been so crazy. I haven't even done that, but well, this um, is your opportunity. Yeah. You're giving your testimonial. Right yeah. Here. So I haven't even posted anything. I just kind of took it all in and I think yeah. you look at in PR, like the credibility comes from other people talking about you. That's a lesson that you learn by being in that space. And yep. so I can say we're great all day, but when you're there and, and other people are saying that and companies are posting, they don't make their own beautiful videos like JP Morgan. We have a lot of like amazing sponsors that have done great things for us. Um, so I'm just kind of letting everybody else do the VR for us. Well, they're and certainly I, doing I mean, it. <laughs> and, and not even the sponsors. I mean, it's 30 days after Future Proof right now. Attendees are still, still sharing post. their thoughts. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, I'll say like in the middle of the year, like if I want to thank my team or something, I have pictures or like I have selfies with a lot of different people, but I'll save them for the right moment. It just nothing else needed to be. It was like future proof threw up on LinkedIn. Like it was, it was just every, like you couldn't, totally. get it off. you couldn't escape so, it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that, you know, and that felt pretty amazing. I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't feel the need to post myself and see how many impressions I got. It just, it just didn't matter. It yeah. was 
that powerful. And that's totally. It's yeah. Cool. It was such an amazing reflection of all the hard work that you guys put in and the payoff that clearly resonated with thousands of people. Yeah. Um, the social buzz was continuing for weeks after the event. Like it was just nonstop. Yeah. It was fun to be part of it for sure. Yeah. Okay. So give us a little teaser. What can people expect at Future Proof Citywide in Miami this spring? And we are yeah, totally welcome for spoilers. Yeah. So Citywide, which is um, going to be on the actual beach. So Art Basel and Food and Wine are the only two large scale events that are actually allowed on the beach in South Beach. So they pack the sand and they literally have a festival on the beach. Um, Matt, our CEO, went down there and lobbied for it. It was it wasn't an easy thing, like because yeah. South Beach is trying to change their image. They broke up with spring break. They're being very like hard on what they allow to come in their space. They're trying to kind of change that image. Um, so we got that approval, and now we're going to be the third large scale event. Um, if you think about festival, the whole vision was that like grow to ten thousand people, and I absolutely think we could have, but we just kind of run out of space. So mm -hmm. I think we're capped at 5,000 there, right? Like the hotels, people, you're, you know, there might be people at the airport or Mata, who knows? We just, we like, we took over all we could and now we're kind of capped. So with the following that we have, we're like, why don't we take an event where we can spread out and include the whole like investment managed ecosystem. Right. So festival is very RIA centric and it's a lot of focus on education for the RIA and all of the sponsors they're targeting. Most of them are targeting that RIA channel, right. um, the, the allocator channel. Um, so with this huge following we have, we're like, let's take us somewhere where we're not going to just grow out of that space. Because if you think about South Beach, you can just go all into the city. And like our vision is that, yes, the beach walk is there with the stages and the content and the one-to-one -one meetings. But we want people to just like spread out through the city yeah. and have whole little events going on and um, just a place where we are, we won't be constricted to grow. Um, the content will skew a little more towards investment management, which we also have a lot of investment management content at the festival. Mm -hmm. Um but I think you'll see that expand a little because we do have, you know, the alts community and a lot of other people that want to, to be in front of our audience. And so those inbounds came, but we were like, we need another place to kind of expand with the format and the approach that we're doing with the technology that is going so well. So I think the vision for Citywide and, you know, will be it will still be the audience will still be very heavy RIA in that first year, of course, because that's just our following. But we want to open that up and, and expand that allocator audience. And that will also evolve and expand who comes from each company, like who yeah. should be there from each company. And so it just gives options. And instead of, you know, waiting all year for the festival, like, does it make sense for me to go to the festival or, or citywide or should I be at both? Like, mm -hmm. what does this look like? And I think it'll, a lot will tell. We, we launched with 33 partners that committed to us back in April to be there. Um, and so I think, you know, we're being conservative in saying 2,500 people. I, I don't think that's going to be hard at all for us to meet that number. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit, you know, it is a first event, uh, but we, we know how to build it outside. We have the same team that works with food and wine. So a lot of their, you know, large tents and things that are in place, we will kind of take over and fill those in. And obviously our sponsors are doing custom things that you'll see out on the beach walk. Um, but then I think it's going to be very cool to watch it evolve and yeah. not feel like we'll grow out of it. We could just keep growing into it. Um, and South Beach is a great place. And who doesn't want to be in Miami in March? That's right. Yeah. I also mean, my birthday. Can't wait. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, there you go. Um, I love the bi-coastal approach. I mean, it makes total sense, plus a different time of the year. Because people yeah. have families. Um, people might be tired of traveling from one coast to the other. Now they have choice. Yeah. And while... Uh, while uh, a compliance officer might remind us all that past performance is not an in indicator of future results, past performance for future proof and the festival would tell me that citywide is going to be a uh, an awesome success. So um, yeah, well, thank I'm you for saying that. But again, we have a lot of believers and a lot of fans. And right now, 95% of our clients aren't choosing. They're, they're planning to be at both. 
And so I'll be at both. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, yeah, that's a huge compliment to us. And, um, you know, Definitely. I'm looking forward to it. I think that the operations team, the marketing team, we have a really great team that hustles. And um, I think we proved that by building something on a concrete parking lot and turning to what you saw this year. And I think we're going to do it again in South Beach. And I'm looking forward to seeing it come to life. Another Absolutely. unsung hero on your team is Paula. My God, she <laughs> is a rock star. Yeah, I mean, I can't name all 17 of them, but everyone, like, yeah. there's literally no one on our team that you can't just pick up the phone and call and they, like, will get something done for you. Oh, it's she would. Great. Yeah, she would text me, uh, Jimmy, make sure you're filling out your breakthrough meeting <laughs> request. And I'm like reading it and I'm like, is this like a form text that gets no, blasted she, to everybody? I know. I, I responded yeah. to her. I'm like, Paula, is this really yeah. you? And she's like, yes, it is. Go <laughs> fill out. He's not a Go bot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a bot texting you. No, I think our customer service level is felt by sponsors and advisors. Um, and that comes from, you know, very high expectations from leadership and it's all important, like the industry small, everyone you touch, every interaction, every communication yeah. can be dealt with integrity and respect and out of support. And when you feel that, it, it spreads quickly. Totally. And yeah. So thank you for saying that about Paul. Well, thank you so much for sharing the incredible story that has created this event series that now is, you know, the talk of the town of the entire industry. Um, I'm going to move us into our play segment, a little pseudo rapid fire. Um, Chris, if it weren't helping design these industry changing events, what would you be doing? You've lived so many lives. Like, mm -hmm. is there another life you have yet to live? Oh, yeah. I'd probably be paddleboarding in Key West and like barking. <laughs> Have a golden retriever. Go. Have a golden retriever. I'd play tennis. I'd paddleboard. I'd do long walks. Maybe bartend just to interact with people like you, Jimmy. I love that for you. <laughs> yeah, like be with people. Like yeah, yeah I'm a full extrovert, like all the way to the tent. So me too. Um, I get my energy from other people, and if I didn't do this, I would definitely need to be doing something that I'm engaging with people well, all day, every day. What's the best drink you can make? <laughs> so I have my own, I have my own drink that like even bartenders today I've been having it for like 10 years so I order a cosmopolitan with Blanco tequila preferably Don Julio but bartenders look at me like okay and then they taste it but yeah that's my drink of choice and if I bartend somewhere I'll make that on the menu Chris's Cosmo <laughs> yeah so, so wait in, in, in Chris's Cosmo there's no vodka it's just tequila Correct. So you okay. just you mix. I didn't know if you had it. both. Yeah. No, you just no. You do the same. The orange liqueur, cranberry, fresh lime, tequila. Love All it. right. Make a cause. You should try it this weekend. See what, tell me what you think. <laughs> well, tequila and I are, uh, we're not on speaking terms. No, if man. you catch my drift. Oh, but. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think we need... again. Yeah. I think we need Chris's Cosmo on the menu at Future Proof Citywide Happy Hour, personally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys should try it. At least yeah. try it. All right. Um, what's your favorite thing to do for fun? Um, yoga, hot yoga, cook. And I love cooking. I grew up uh, with an Italian family. So Sunday dinners, like go buy fresh ingredients, cook, mm -hmm. listen to loud music in the kitchen, drink wine while we're cooking. Yeah. Yes. How many how many hours does it take for you to make your sauce? Your gravy. Uh, uh sorry. which term do you use? I'm... So no, I make bolognese. So, but I, I, okay. It probably takes me an hour to get it like ready, and then it sits for three longer, shorter. Okay. Okay. I went to okay. cooking school in Tuscany like mm, eighteen years ago. And, Another uh, life uncovered. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> oh well, my no, gosh! It, it, it was like a it was like a ten day cooking school, wasn't that? Okay. Was that okay. Exciting. But still, but I learned to make bolognese with carrots in it with milk in it with wine in it like things maybe most i don't know i love it it's fun to do chris That's cherry amazing. under the tuscan sun who would have thought <laughs> <it>? <laughs> um okay we like to close our show with a moment of gratitude just give you the opportunity to shout up someone in the industry and you're on your team who you admire just say something nice about someone who you think might be listening yeah look i think um it, it would have to be my team they are literally just 
all workhorses. I, Kevin is the only one I didn't handpick. Um, although I still say I handpicked him because he and I became friends the year before and I was working with him to get a couple of clients there. And I was like, how can I help you? Is there anyone you don't know that I can introduce you to? And we bonded over golden retrievers. And so I might not have picked him, but I definitely wanted to work with him. But my entire team, I, I've hired and there's six of us now and it's pretty awesome. They're all unique and we act like a family and I'm just really grateful for them. We push them a lot. We give them a lot of appreciation, but um, in this fast growth, we went from one event to two events. We're going to four events. They, they just never, ever disappoint. They're extremely hard workers. Um, obviously gratitude for them. And then yeah. look, there's so many other people, like you can't just pick one people. Like, I think I have probably 10 clients that I think are my favorite clients and I genuinely do like love them and become friends with them. Um, and then there's people in the industry that did a lot for me and, yeah. you know, always just introduced me to people with, with no quid pro quo, just, just to do it. And so I think we are, we're lucky to work in an industry where people are building each other up and supporting each other. And so I'm grateful for my team and I'm grateful to be in this industry with so many supportive people that now have become my friends too. Yeah. Love it. We're grateful to have you in this industry. Um, thanks Thank so much. You, Chris. Thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate you guys having me on and um, I look forward to seeing you soon in Miami. Absolutely. To our listeners, we hope you learned something new and enjoyed hearing Chris's incredible story. And we encourage you to join us for Citywide in the spring. Thank you so much for being on the show, Chris. And to everyone who listened today, be sure to write us via email at pressplay at streetcredpr.com to tell us what you think, ask us any questions, suggest any guests, or even just tell us what you had for lunch today. Thanks again for tuning in. And we can't wait to introduce you to our next guest. Bye. Thanks, Lena. Bye, Jimmy. Bye, guys. Thank you.